Okay. So, um, you, you probably missed a, a lot of what I was uh, demonstrating. So uh, I'll open an occurrence and again just walk through quickly the uh, the fields that are on the task. Is everybody getting seeing that task open? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. All right. If there's any if if it doesn't seem to be changing, jump in and let me know. Um, so there's a subject and a description field uh, that is useful for you know putting in instructions and comments. Um, and um, whenever we open a uh, task and and make it change, it's a recurring task. Um, then and we save it. It's going to make an exception to the recurring task. So you'll notice that uh, on the left here we have some visual like this is an exception to the recurring task. The um, recurring task itself propagates to the next month in the cycle as to when it would uh, you know become uh, available. So you don't get to see in this particular view all future occurrences, you just see any exceptions that have not been marked completed, and then the recurring task itself. And as I was demonstrating earlier, when you go to open a recurring task, you're prompted to either open the occurrence by default, it's just the single this month uh, activity, or you can open up the entire series. And if we open the series, we can go in, and I don't think you got to see this as well, so I'll, I'll quickly review it, that under the recurrence, you can set daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, a start and end time, what the occurrence pattern looks like. This is all probably pretty familiar from Outlook or uh, any of the other uh, CRM tools. So um, you can specify an end date or how many occurrences before it ends or, or leave it as indefinite. Um, so. Uh, so we have standalone, non-recurring tasks, recurring tasks, and then within the recurring tasks, we have um, uh, the entire series, an occurrence of that series, or an exception to the series. And an exception is just something where you've modified it uh, from, from a given occurrence. Um, you've modified it in some way. OK, so uh, some of the other elements that uh, I wanted to mention is, the, of course, the priority, low, normal, high, um, whether it's in progress or not started, waiting on someone else deferred or completed, um, who the owner is uh, of a task, and we'll discuss that a little bit more, and then uh, some uh, time frames. Obviously, you could schedule as much or as little detail as you want um, in terms of how long a task may take to complete. Um, and then we'll talk about spawn tasks uh, later on. So. Pretty simple stuff, um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about these views here. So this is a list view where um, we can, I can see um, a whole series of, of, of tasks, and they're by default sorted in chronological order according to their start date. You'll notice that um, some of them are red, and that means that they are past due. Uh, so. It's always a visual clue that, hey, better get your work done. Um, who the owner is, um, right now I'm only looking at, at my tasks, um, the status of them, if they've been deferred or uh, not started yet. Um, and we'll talk about these categories in, in a little more detail. But we also have some other views. Um, and yes. Uh, with, yes? Uh, what about those two red lines further down? They have an earlier date, but they show here. Why is that? Uh, let's see here. Well, this is a 226, uh, 223 of 2016. I'm, I must have them sorted by category right now. So I actually unsorted them. So now they show at the top according to the uh, start date. Oh, okay. So I, that's exactly what I was going to mention next is that you can do some things. Let's say, for example, I want to group this by client. I can. This is a grid, just like all of our other kind of super grids, you know, that we have in Tams, where you can sort and group as, uh, uh, as many layers of complexity as you would like. So you could take a client and group them, and then you can go by another layer of category, and then we can open up, you know, a particular client, and we can look at the different categories, and then open them up, and, and so forth. 
Um, of course, sorting, uh, so that's grouping. Sorting is also simple. You can change, just click and sort by ascending or descending order, and you can even sort, uh, subsort within by holding the shift button down. This is the same for all of our grids and TAMs. So, uh, and that's documented in the help about, you know, sorting and, and grouping. So um, it's, it's useful to have this list view um, for sorting and grouping and having kind of a, a view of, of everything um, that's on your plate. We also have, though, uh, like a daytime view. So if you want to see what's on your uh, calendar for today or for next week, and of course the times of start and end times are going to be represented. There's a work week view, um, which you can scroll to the right and left here and see each day of the week as you scroll. Um, you can do the entire week view, uh, which gives you a kind of a, a, a what, what your week ahead looks like, and you can even do a month view. And on these views, you can double click on any of these tasks and open them right from the views as well. And again, if it's a recurring series, it'll prompt you as to whether you're working on the, just the occurrence or modifying the entire series. I like the list view the, the best, and that's the default view when you open the, uh, the, the scheduler. Okay. So one of the other things that um, when a task gets completed, it suppresses it on this list view. But if you want to see it, you can click on the show completed tasks. And uh, it takes a moment because actually we've been using this scheduler for, for many, many years and uh, since it was developed. And you'll see all of these tasks. And again, you can sort and group uh, uh, you know, uh, on any of these completed tasks. Um, we also have... Um, a, a field chooser here for some fields that aren't normally listed on this display, but you can drag them in and drop them. So let's see, we want to see the time, the day and time that it was completed. And um, in fact, that was a, a capability that we added uh, last year. So not all of these uh, show the completed date. It was a customization that we added. But you can see ever since then that we can see, which is nice, because then you can see when it was uh, supposed to be started and when it was actually completed and then uh, we envision doing some reports down the line so that you can get a metric as to how you know how well you're tracking to your schedules you know or are there um, individuals that are perhaps you know falling down on you know laying down on the job and not getting their their tasks done in a timely fashion so that brings me to um, this other view uh, at called the manager's view, and I'm going to turn off the completed tasks. But for managers, and that's something that is um, specified under the user, um, under the user uh, parameters as to whether somebody is designated as a uh, manager or not. So um, when someone is designated as a manager, they get this extra drop-down box. And as a manager, I can take a look at anybody that I have set up as a user in TAMS and look at their tasks, okay? Um, and I can even look across all of, the, all of the organization and all tasks. And then again, I can sort and group by client or you know, service, you know, category. And uh, we'll discuss those categories next here as to what, what are all these different categories mean. So. Any questions so far about, you know, what a task is all about, uh, non-recurring, recurring, and some of these views? Good. Okay, so let's talk about categories. Um, and what you'll notice here, I'm going to just sort by category so that you can see that there are these cellular account billing cycle due, and there are um, cellular account tasks, and then there's service account billing cycle due. And... Um, let me go through each of these so that you can uh, appreciate the um, why having these tasks man being managed in TAMS is better than putting them in Outlook or um, uh, what's the other popular one? Does anybody use anything outside besides Outlook for CRM? No. Yeah, um, I'm drawing a blank right now on one of the other more popular ones, but um, anyway. Um, so, uh, these tasks can be generated. Uh, let's talk about the cellular account billing cycle due. And once I explain cellular, landline is identical. You'll notice that I have uh, a link here that says view account. It's a right mouse click to bring up this menu. And I can navigate directly from an account to the task manager or back. So let's, uh, by 
right-clicking and viewing the account, you'll see that we have um, a reminder set up for um, this particular account, and this is an optimized account. It has some billable durations in there, and we need to go gather their bills each month, and of course we add them in, import the usage, reconcile the bills. Um, but uh, it, when we're on this tab for the account invoice data, if there is already re a reminder existing, I can open the series, not the uh, individual occurrence, but the series for that tab. And as a manager, I can reassign this task to some other owner. So I can make sure that you know the right people are, are assigned uh, the, these um, these jobs. And if I change the uh, assignment, then it'll show up on the new owner's uh, task list, um, and, and you know uh, it'll fall off of the one that it was previously assigned to. Now we don't normally go around reassigning the, the tasks very much, um, but if I happen to take a, a client that I don't have uh, a task set up for, and I'll go ahead and, uh, and and try to select an account here that doesn't have a task set up on it, and you'll notice how instead of it saying open reminder, it says set reminder. Now the last billing cycle that we have in here was March 13th. If I click the set reminder, it automatically creates a recurring task that's due on the 20th, and by default it's a, a one-week delay, and that's just because it maybe takes a week for Verizon or AT&T or other carriers to post the bills online. And it starts at the following month, so it's going to be 420 instead of, so we already got the 313 in there, so it moves a month and a week ahead, and it creates this as a recurring task on the day 20 of every month with no end date. So those are the defaults. You can change the values, but it, it gives a title about auditing this account for uh, this supplier, and it assigns it to me since I created this task, but I could reassign it to somebody else. And it marks it as a cellular accounts billing cycle due type of, of task. Okay, so uh, you notice the defaults are even from 8 to 8.30 in the morning. So um, it sets a reminder. And um, I'm going to close this without saving it. If I save it, it would change this to open reminder. So if there's no reminder already in place, it says set reminder. If it's already in place, it will say open reminder. And if you cancel a reminder, so let's do it. I'm going to save it using the defaults. Now it says open. I'm going to open it. Again, I'm looking at the series. I'm going to delete it. And now it goes back to set reminder. Okay, same thing is true for landline accounts. So we have landline cellular billing cycles, uh, landline and cellular billing cycles that are, um, and in our you know, training here, they're linked to the accounts and they're recurring by default. But you can change the defaults. We also have another uh, task that is useful um, called uh, just a general account task, and it's linked and non recurring by default, but again, it can be recurring. So same idea, but instead of doing the audits, it's just a general add a task. So this is the catch-all for any account, for any client, landline or cellular. It'll just have a little bit different category. It defaults the client, and again, uh, this is a non-recurring, but I could make it a recurring if I wanted to. Any, any questions about those types? And I can add as many of these tasks per account as I deem necessary. So I could have 10, 10 different tasks all for this account. I could have one of them be recurring and nine of them be non-recurring. So, but they are linked so that when you are on the scheduler and you see a task that is um, a, a linked to an account, I can just right-click and view the account, and it will take me straight to that account. Okay, A any questions about those two types of tasks? Okay, there's another type of a, of a, of a task that is called the contract ending. So um, I'm going to uh, take, a, uh, take an account that uh, uh, has a contract. This is a landline account. You can do this for cellular as well. And what it does is when you put in your contract information for a client, and you can see that it's going to end on uh, May 24th of 2015, if you set a reminder here, it has a different subject that's defaulted, and of course you can edit this however you want. It's a different type of category, but it's still linked to the client and linked to the account. And it says, hey, this is a high priority because it's time critical. 
Again, you can change all of these defaults, but it puts it 90 days, or um, let's see what we got here, uh, to the uh, prior to the end date. So it looks like maybe 60, uh, 90 days to February, March, April, May. So maybe it's 100 days, and we'll find out. So the, the start time here is in advance of the actual contract end date. And the amount of time that it is specified to be in advance, right here it is, 100 days. We have a global preference that you can customize so that if you have an evergreen clause in a contract that says, hey, this automatically renews, you know, unless we receive notice 60 days in advance, well, set your reminders far enough ahead of time so that you can, um, you know, act on those contract ending dates prior to them ending. And that it creates future opportunity for finding savings for clients. And if it's an evergreen and you miss that deadline, you're going to miss out on the opportunity to take a $1,000 PRI uh, circuit and turn it into a $200 uh, SIP trunk. So um, those are uh, kind of time critical. Uh, and they uh, do, by default, get set to a high priority. So. Um, High priority tasks, I'll show you here in a minute. By the way, uh, just so you know, if you want to generate um, the non-renewal letter to say, please don't uh, automatically renew, uh, our form letter uh, templates can be completely customizable. But by just clicking that link, it automatically uh, creates from the template for this particular account uh, notice to not, you know, um, you know, renew the contract on this account number, and it fills in, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, about 90, 95% of the letter. So, so generating this letter can actually be done by somebody with very, you know, little training. So setting the reminders, very simple, click of a mouse, uh, click of a link, and then generating those uh, non-renewal letters. There's another time critical uh, or significant uh, date that is uh, also built into TAMS, and that is another category which is under process management for the client, and that is to generate a reminder when their uh, service agreement is ending. So if you have a contract with a client and their service agreement is ending, you can uh, gener create a reminder that says, hey, your service, not the, not the carriers, but your own agreement with the client is ending. And you can, um, again, uh, set a separate um, advance uh, you know, notice of how far in, prior to the end date would you like to, that reminder to, to uh, you know, be on the task scheduler. Now that's also a normally a non-recurring reminder or task. That would be a, uh, a you know a single occurrence type of a task by default. Okay, so um, so let me go through and uh, open up the scheduler here and uh, talk about some of these things. Like say um, here, you'll notice that the high priority have an exclamation. Anything that's past due is red. Any exceptions have a slash through them. Um, completed tasks are, are, have a strike through, and you can suppress or show those. Um, some of the things that uh, there's one other category, which is called a user specified appointment. So we talked about the billing cycles, general account tasks that are non-recurring by default, the contract ending, um, using the default duration parameters. Those duration parameters are, are customizable. Service agreement ending. Um, and then there's this catch-all called user specified. And the user specified is you just come in and say new task. It, you can assign any owner you want to it. You can um, tag it to a client so that it may be a, a, an activity associated to a particular client. Um, but notice it's called user specified appointment. Set the date, make it recurring or non-recurring, and uh, uh, and then you can. Um, and some of those tasks we use uh, for um, client project activity that's not associated to an account. If it is associated to account, we'll generate that task as an account task so that it becomes linked. Okay, um, these user specified ones aren't linked in any way, but uh, even things like SAP management, like doing biweekly timesheets or whatever, little reminders, um, just as effective as being in uh, in Outlook, but it's all in one place for them. 
So uh, that covers um, the, the, the task basics, the task types of recurring and unrecurring, um, exceptions, views, list view, um, day, work week, week, and month, looking at completed tasks, the manager's view, different categories of tasks. And so that's going to bring us to uh, workflows where it really becomes um, you know, more advanced. So before I, I jump into that, I'll, I'll take a breath and ask if there's any comments or questions about what we've seen so far. No? Nope. Oh, okay, good. So, uh, so let's talk about uh, uh, a workflow and what we call spawned tasks. Um, so we have some spawn tasks already set up, and we've incorporated this since uh, the, they were incorporated, I think, last uh, summer is when the release came out that, that uh, offered spawn tasks. And um, we have started to implement them, and we're finding them extremely beneficial. So um, we uh, brought on a, a new employee uh, about two months ago, and uh, uh, all of these tasks are on this new employee here, Nani, uh, and uh, she's been uh, fantastic at um, helping all of us um, get our, our work done. And um, you can see just the, the number of but some of these t tasks are, are future dated all the way out to you know, April or whatever. So um, I'm going to just walk you through a couple of these. Uh, let's see here. So the mo most, one of the most common is that we need to do these monthly audits on the accounts that we've optimized. So I'm going to open the series and show you that there's this uh, parent, what we call a parent task, and um, it is to do a pre-audit on a, a given client account. Now, some of our uh, pre-audit maybe have um, some more uh, instructions, and let me try to pick one of those just to uh, illustrate some of the uh, items that we may put into a pre-audit uh, type of uh, of tasks. So download the invoice in PDF format and request and download a device report. So those are the steps and of course the details of logging in, that's all contained under the account notes, you know, and the login permissions. So we don't need to duplicate those within the task. Uh, in, in fact, um, she can just go straight to the, the account um, and we can, uh, you know, uh, have the login permissions available and the um, you know information that's necessary for running the scripts or whatever in order to to audit the account. Um, you can put as much or a little of, of that detail as you want into into the uh, the task. So then uh, let me let me go back to the, one of those pre audits um, and uh, here's one. So we're, uh, within that series, once the information has been gathered from the carrier, downloaded, scripted, and ready for import, then we have a spawn task, and we can have um, as many spawn tasks as we want. So this list doesn't have to be a single spawn. When, you, when this task is marked completed, then it will spawn another task, and that other task can be assigned to somebody else. So uh, one person can go and download the information and do you know, the scripting, and, and then it can be handed over to the analyst. And notice we have a little note in here that after the data that download and the script is run, then, then this will flow to the next person in the sequence. Um, and it can have a different priority, a different owner, um, and uh, uh, it also can have additional spawn tasks, and I'll show you an example of this. So a... Um, so this task will not show up on, on Randy's uh, list of things to do for this given instance for this month until um, the uh, particular occurrence for this month of the pre-audit is completed. So notice I opened up the series in order to show you because the series is the template for all occurrences. Now if it's not a series, if it's a standalone one-time task, then you know it's you can also spawn one-time occurrences, but if you open a um, series and have it spawn a task, then you will not necessarily see the spawned tasks. Um, well, you'll see it, but you won't be able to. Um, um, 
how can I how can I explain this? The the series is how you should define the um, the cascading tasks. Does that is that clear? Not entirely. I guess until we listen until I see you actually using it. But. Okay. So so let me go ahead and, and create a new task. How do you say that? Uh, uh, not until the task is a spawn, you can see it. Yeah. So, so, and that's going to be a limitation I'm going to talk about. But, um, so I'm going to create a test return a uh, task that's recurring, and it's going to occur on day, um, day, uh, you know, uh, one of every month, starting on uh, March first. Okay, now notice if I come to my spawn tasks, there is a limitation, and, and I'm going to show you those here in a minute. But I could not create a spawn task until I actually save the, um, the task that I am creating as a parent. So I can tag it to a client. Of course, these can all be d d developed uh, you know, from those automatically generated tasks that we already reviewed. Um, I'm just going to leave it for none as a test task. But I cannot add a spawn task until I create the parent task. So I'm going to do a save and close on this. And you will see that up here that I have a recurring task task. Now I can open the series, and I can come over to the spawned task, and I can add a new item. And now you'll see how it says spawn task at the top. And this is a test uh, uh, spawned task from recurring task. And this will come to me. It's going to be, so when, uh, and this is going to be uh, step two. Okay, and I'm going to save and close that. When I save it, it's going to show up in the list of spawn tasks from the parent. So let's just take it two levels deep because I think that's simple. So now Nani would come in and say, oh, I have a, a, an occurrence to work on. I'm going to mark it complete. I've got my job done on this one. I do whatever I need to do, and I save it and close it. So on her task list, it's going to now jump to April 1st for the next occurrence. And over on my list, it's going to uh, create a task that it is dated as of today. So my due date is her completed date. So uh, obviously it wouldn't be fair for me to have something due three weeks ago when I just got it on my plate today. So now notice it is no longer a recurring task. It is spawned off of a recurring task as a standalone task. So now I can open it up. It is now step two. And then when I mark it completed, it, that task is, is gone. For, for, for that cycle. Then the next cycle will begin. It's a very pretty simple concept, actually. It's just that, um, you know, then on uh, April 1st will be the next occurrence of that recurring task. And again, cascading workflow tasks like this do not need to be recurring. They could be one-time project tasks. So, um, each of the, each of the casts in the, in the tasks in the sequence can have their own assigned owner, their own uh, priority, um, their own notes, their own uh, subject title, and and so forth. Okay. So the, fa I, the fact that Nani prepared a spawn task on that particular instance will that mean that the next time the recurring task occurs that it will automatically have a spawn task associated with it? Or does yeah, so if I open up this occurrence, you will see that I have, now this is for April, it will spawn another task. Okay. So okay. that it remembers, uh, that it remembers the sequence and so on and so on. It's recursive, right? So, so if I have a task, let's take a task here. That is, now most of our tasks are two levels, but you can do three, four, five, as many layers deep as you want. Uh, let's find one for, um, another type of t task that we have, which is checking data pools. So we have some clients under um, managed services, 
and uh, we proactively check their pools before the billing cycle closes. So it's a high priority because we only want to check it a couple days before the end of the cycle. So it says it occurs day six of every month. Now we always give ourselves a couple days because it could be you know a weekend or something like that, right? Um, but uh, we um, want to have a few days to note, look at the pools, notify the client, make a recommendation to maybe increase a pool that's, uh, where they have a spike in usage or whatever. And this can be for any you know data, landline, account. Uh, we're doing it on cellular here. Notice that uh, uh, then she will go and get uh, the information. Um, and then uh, within, um, I think I actually had this set up. Uh, let's see if I did this. There it is. So then uh, it would spawn a task to me to review the data pool usage, uh, and the information can be stored in the, uh, in the journal or wherever. Uh, and then when I am done reviewing it, I can spawn it back to her and say, hey, implement any changes and to see the journal entries for the changes that are needed. So basically, I only have to, to spend you know, five minutes looking at something of a task that normally would take you know, 20 minutes to do. So this is one example of how you know tasks can flow back and forth between people or down a chain uh, through a sequence like you know do analysis, do an optimization, do implementation or whatever. You could take this from a sales cycle once an agreement is signed all the way through the process of baselining accounts, you know setting up online access, breaking them down into small bite-sized pieces, and assigning them to the, the people that are most appropriately suited to do them all the way through to billing, right? So um, there's really no, uh, and because you can also spawn multiple tasks, I could add a second item here and have it go to two people. So if you can branch from one person when they're done, all of a sudden two other people get, um, get assigned uh, their own independent tasks. Or, two, or one person gets two tasks, you know? Uh, so it's a very, very flexible capability. <laughs> Chris, yes. Chris, you mentioned um, that that you could set up like a workflow when you first signed a client. Here's the steps we go through to set them up, baseline everything, the, the data we need together, all the steps. Yep. Is there a way to create that as kind of a master task that could then be cloned right. and shared yeah. between all the clients? Um, you know what? That's like phase two of this concept. It was originally part of our original concept, and that is that you could create a workflow template and then, um, you know, have the flexibility to go in and, and clone that template and then, and then, um, and then reassign different staff members perhaps, you know. Um, so uh, we don't uh, have that part of it yet, but uh, certainly um, it's not a very uh, – you know, uh, it's not a big time saver to, to have that uh, at this point because you can see adding a task and assigning it is is just a you know a few minutes really, uh, but but it's on the radar. So good question though. I think that that would be a nice capability to um, to take one. And really, all we're talking about is taking something like this and copying that record as a master. You know, and you could even call it master. You know. Um, so. So how do you handle that today? Do you just have that maybe documented somewhere, like in a Word file, and then you just set up those tasks that you're going to need for each new client? I open up two copies, and if I'm going to do, uh, you know, I'll go through and uh, copy and paste some of my notes um, into okay. the, like, the, the, the descriptions or something. So, yeah. Um, the other thing is... Um, because we, most of our accounts or most of our tasks are linked tasks for doing, uh, you know, to like set up a baseline, like here's um, setting up, you know, getting the LOA and the online access and the, the um, you know, uh, CSRs and things for, um, for landline accounts. We want those to be linked tasks, so they're generated through this add task uh, button here, and that starts off our parent um, task, and then if it cascades through spawn tasks, um, it will all, they will also be linked. So um, having a master at the top that's not linked would kind of take away some of that extra integrated functionality. Um, so 
just to kind of cast a little more light on on why we don't have that in this in the in the system yet. Um, I do need to uh, let's see spawn task may be as successive as desired. A completed task may spawn multiple child tasks. We talked about that. Adding a spawn task. So when you add a task, you must save it before you can create another child. You can't say in a relational database, it's really uh, more challenging to you know, try to create a bunch of, of, of templates before you start adding children to them. So there is the, a, a, the one, um, let's say, criteria that you must save the uh, a, a new task and reopen it before you um, you know add any sub subordinate child tasks to it um, and, and if you try to add a child task and it hasn't been saved yet it, the buttons inactive it won't work okay so here's a couple of, of, of limitations that are actually um, well, this is by design and that is child spawned tasks cannot be recurring. So if I open up a, a series here and it has a spawn task and I open the spawn task, this cannot be recurring. And here's why. If we already have a recurring parent task and then it creates a, spawn, a, a child task and then that child becomes recurring every month, then you would have a child task for the first occurrence of the parent being spawned every month, and then the second occurrence of the parent, which is also a recurring task, would start to spawn recurring child tasks every month. And so you'd have multiple spawned child tasks every month for the same master parent. And we don't we didn't want it to become, you know, like a virus, <laughs> right? So uh you know, so we restricted by intention that when you're on a spawned task, and you know because the title says spawn task, the recurrence button is inactive. So you cannot have a, ch a spawned child task as a recurring task. Make sense? Yes. Yep. Okay. Here's another thing that we found that would be a useful enhancement. We don't think it'll be a big uh, ordeal to uh, incorporate, but. Um, if I look at, let's say I'm going to close this, if I look at my view of my tasks, and you can see uh, I have you know some red ones here, what I don't see in my view is what's coming at me, because I'm going to get tasks when Nani or somebody else gets some work done. It's going to show up today, tomorrow, the next day on my list. I don't see, like in, even in my week ahead, because they are spawned children tasks, I don't get to see them as what, like in my week ahead, I don't really know what's, what's coming at me. Now, as a manager, of course, I can look at somebody else's uh, lists and see what's happening here, but these can spawn off to different people on, in, our, in our organization, you know. So uh, we would like to probably put a column on here so that you can kind of see what's coming at you. Uh, what's upstream, you know, and then also it would be nice, I mean, even though when you have a, down, a task that's downstream from you, um, you can open the task and see who does uh, this go to, and you can see the owner name of the spawn child task. And you can drill down and go further and look at, you know, how many steps ahead you want. It would be nice to be able to see those on this list view of uh, what's downstream also. Um, it would just be easier, like if you have a question or you need to give somebody a heads up that, hey, I can't get into this website, they, you know, we got locked out or something like that, you could just go notify that person. So that thing you normally see this time of the month, you're not going to see it for a couple days perhaps. Um, so th that's just, a, a, you know, a, again, an enhancement to the view that I think would be, would be beneficial. Um, and what are the best uses? The, here's our most common, um, of course, you can think of all kinds of uh, uses. But um, So we talked about doing the um, pool size management prior to the end of a cycle so you can increase it to avoid overcharges, have one person gather the data, another person review it, and then perhaps go back to that other person for the first person or, or a third person for implementing changes pr prior to the billing cycle closing. Uh, certainly our monthly audit sequences that are recurring every month and to have somebody gather um, the information and then somebody else doing the audit and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then the analysis. Um, in fact, you can have one person say, okay, I got this bill reconciled so that it, everything matches within 1% and it's nice and green. 
but then maybe you have another person that says, uh, okay, I'm going to now analyze, or it goes to the next to the same person that says, now reanalyze and look for more savings opportunities. We generate a lot of additional revenue because we don't just optimize our accounts once and close a blind eye to it, particularly cellular. We react to all kinds of promos and, and changes in usages and, and continually refine. And sometimes, you know, it's only $100 here or a couple hundred dollars there. But by the end of the year, hey, we've saved you another $4,000 a year um, because of these incremental, uh, you know, uh, course corrections that we've made. And then finally, doing things like quarterly actions. Uh, so what we've done is implemented a, a, a mechanism, and you'll see some of these are also listed in here, to where we uh, have one person assigned to go and um, generate the quarterly no usage reports. Uh, and if I, I can sort by subject here or whatever, generally three-month no usage report. And then when that report is done, it goes to whoever the analyst is that owns that account. And here's some instructions, you know, run the report twice and save it under this location. And then this next person would notify the client that, hey, we found, you know, eight devices that haven't had any usage in the last three months. Perhaps they should be suspended or canceled in order to reduce costs. So, um, again, these can be... Um, uh, quarterly or monthly, um, as periodic as you want them to be. Clearly, uh, some of the other um, project activities can also be uh, as a project management system to make sure that all of the steps along the way get addressed. So um, that pretty much covers it. Uh, so I'll leave it open for questions. We have a few minutes left, but uh, I think we've covered the gambit of uh, what all is involved in the uh, the TAM scheduler and how it can help, uh, you know, organizations that are subcontracting with multiple or with multiple employees or even individuals that have lots and lots of clients and lots of things to do uh, to quickly uh, add tasks to the task manager and to have them come up. Oh, I didn't show you this. Reminders. So um, when you, you know, we do have reminders and of course, if you, um, when you open the tool and the timers go off, then you do get reminders just like you would in Outlook or whatever as well. So, um, of course, you know, the title and the noise is a little bit different so it doesn't confuse you with Outlook. But uh, you can open these tasks right from the reminders or dismiss them or snooze them or whatever. So I just didn't, I forgot to mention that we have a, a reminders uh, built into these tasks as well. Well, well, that kind of leads me to my main question, and that is you kind of have to be logged into TAMS for this really to be useful, you know. So if you're yep. alone a lot like I am, meaning that I'm out and doing things when I really can't be logged into TAMS, it kind of diminishes the value. Like it's almost like you'd have to have a mobile app or something or yep. whatever, you know, so that you could see right. It. Well, that's, you're, that's I agree. You know, it's not. It doesn't synchronize with your phone like uh, Outlook. I mean, we we have an Exchange server and we synchronize our, you know, our our calendars right. and our contacts. Um, mm -hmm. So we, 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 we you don't have that synchron synchronization capability. But hey, if you don't have Outlook open, and, you know, and you're sitting at your desk, you don't get those reminders either. Uh, but unless you know you're, they're on your phone. But um, well, yeah, so, you have to have so Outlook always up going and running. To my phone, yeah. Yes, I'm always yeah. going to my phone, you know, so I'm always getting right. it. But I, honestly, what are you going to do on your phone when you have to audit a, a TAMS account, right? I mean, it, at some point, it's not intended okay. for scheduling your meetings and things necessarily. It's another right. tool in the toolbox. So I think it has a, a place that exceeds other tools, but certainly falls short in, the, you know, it depends on what you're trying to use it for. Right, right. That's true. You can just view it as only helping you schedule your TAM-specific tasks, and therefore you only really want them when you're logged in and you can do something. So I guess from that yeah. perspective, it, it works. Well, and we use it as a checklist. Like, okay, we only bill for, for accounts that we put an entry in, an audit, you know, cycle in. Even the deleted accounts that have, you know, for things that have been deleted, you'll see a lot on my list, you know, is that I have to add a billing cycle each month for each client to be able to pick up those savings of deleted services that were that were billable savings, you know. Um, so it's just a checklist to make sure that, hey, we got it all done. And when I go to bill a client, if I'm viewing across all of my uh, users here and uh, I want to see if it's time to, to bill somebody, uh, 
I can look at um, their status. Uh, let me let me try to pick one here that, and I can see that oh, I can't do the billing for this client until after the 23rd, and this particular task gets completed. Uh, that way, I know all of my tasks. If they're all if they all have a reminder for a given client. That I want them all done for a given calendar month before, so it's a good checklist as well. You know, even like I said, if you if you work by yourself, it creates a um, an organizational structure of things that need to be done across all your clients. So to, uh, even as a single user, I think it's extremely useful. Chris, yeah, uh, I forgot how you got to this uh, times of schedule view. But how do it, you get to that? It's you know. I, we should probably have it under the tools menu, but it's under the file menu. I'm not oh, quite sure how we ended up with it under the file menu. Um, we can always talk about moving it to a, you know, to a better. Uh, the, I think the tools would, would be a better fit for it. All right, thank you. Yeah. Of course, like as you know, you can get um, two individual tasks from you know if they're linked. You can open those tasks directly from the account or or whatever. Sure. But um, yeah. So any any uh, any other questions about what we we showed here? Um, it. I have a question on uh, as you go in through these workflow tasks. Is there a way for that to somehow be linked to the journal, so that you can keep track of the activity and maybe the amount of time it took? Right. Especially if you're charging a client back for that time. Yes. So we, there is no automatic link, and again, I think that that's a good suggestion for an enhancement. But if we are working on accounts, which, by the way, we we have clients that we bill hourly as, as well for project services. Um, so clearly, being able to jump to the account and then put the journal entries in there, and you can see that we m maintain how much time we spend on each task and whether they're billable or not. So, and as you know, you can set a hourly rate on a given client for things that are billable. Um, so, and there are, uh, um, in, in fact, invoices off of the journal for billable activity. So, uh, when you open those, when you generate them and you accept them, then it marks the ones that were marked that had not been invoiced before as having been invoiced. And so you can see, you know, like in this case, we don't have uh, anything billable or invoiced, but it automatically will will fill in the check boxes when you uh, create the. Um, the invoice. So there is um, obviously uh, some very quick connections about you know maybe less than than one second to get from the scheduler to the um, you know account where the journal entries would be stored. Um, but what we don't have is the ability that if you are opening a task and you want to put some information in here for it to store how much time you spent and whether it's billable or not and for it to flow automatically to the journal. So um, what we could perhaps do is for linked, um, linked entries, we could actually put a, an echo of the journal down here so that you kind of get a a snippet to add journal entries or modify, although, you know, I think we'd have to restrict it to maybe just adding new journal entries. Um, and as you know, journal entries can be, um, new entries can be added, or, uh, let's see here, you can um, add history to existing journal entries and change your time. So if I add a, a, a task of 0.75, now it totals up to one minute for that one master journal entry, but it has two different timestamps and two different entries. So I'm going to delete that. Um, anyway, so the journal, you know, it, it really has a distinct functionality. Um, and we have had some discussions about do we store everything in the journal or do we put it in the task. We've decided to keep everything in the journal. The, the nice thing about the journal is that it is um, basically searchable. So if I want to look for things that are um, 
you know, like global or put in a phone number, as I start typing in information, I'm going to filter through all my journal entries to the, to the ones that match. Uh, that's such a nice capability, particularly when you have journal entries that are huge, um, like this one, uh, and I would just want to find something for a phone number. I don't uh, really want to go po poking through a whole bunch of different completed tasks to find out what, what, you know, what might have that same information in it. So again, we defer most of our documentation to the journal and use its capabilities. So what, what do you use the journal for non-dealable entries? I see you have a lot of entries there. If you're not using them to, to invoice or even invoice uh, no, no charge uh, to a client, and you yeah. already, already have the scheduler for internal scheduling purposes, why would you use the journal for all those, uh, you know, recorded uh, well, time? So like when we check pool sizes, there's information in there. Um, if we need to um, put in a request for a uh, credit, um, we will document those uh, activities, and then whenever the next cycle comes in, we can leave it open. And then when the credit becomes posted, we will not we will mark it as a um, billable adjustment. Like these are billable adjustments, so that we know that hey, that's effort that we had done. We documented it in the journal, and then when it comes through, we know to mark it billable, and then to mark that task as completed. Um, we may send a recommendation to a client for a, an additional enhancement and document it in the journal. And then whenever they um, approve it, we will implement and add history to the journal uh, that it was called in or an email was sent in or whatever. And again, when it comes through, we can mark it closed. So uh, the journal has the ability to keep track of these all of these activities that aren't necessarily billable time, but are part of a project effort or a, uh, a, a contingency optimization or even managed services. So it, the journal, it, we find like keeping track of the reference numbers and, and those sorts of things is quite beneficial, even though we're not billing for our time. Hmm. Seems like two somewhat parallel systems. Yeah, and you know what, it really, I mean, sometimes it's like really great when you're working with a group of people to be able to journal what you're doing and then the next person that comes in behind you can look at that and go, okay, I get it. Um, but even for my future self, you know, I like to communicate to future Chris, right? And so because there's so many clients and so many accounts and everything, I don't remember 30 days from now what I was doing today, you know. So having that, and it doesn't, it's a really lightweight thing. So making a few notes of what was, what my expectation is for the next cycle really helps, you know, future Chris uh, get his job done. So it's mostly, you, you might call it notes. Other than yeah. journal, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, but like I said, they can be used for billing, uh, tracking, time tracking, and it's mm -hmm. integrated to the billing capabilities. Um, and because it can track reference numbers of, of open tickets with carriers on the account that they're opened on, um, and having status and being searchable, it, it really has a lot of flexibility as well. I use the, uh, the task feature in Outlook to do a lot of this and it becomes both of your systems in one and it's kind of like closer to my contacts and closer to my email. So Yeah. I would, I mean, while I can see, I mean, you're certainly, the, uh, the scheduler is, is much more, um, you know, customized for our, our use and so forth and, and it's linked to the customers and everything. Um, I have a hard time deciding which way I want to go, you know, because like right. I said, I, well, I created look, tasks, and they, they kind of, like my tasks become a template for how I handle a customer, you know, and then I, yeah. in there, I put the names of the person I spoke to at the carrier, I put in account numbers, I put whatever, you know, and then I set reminders, and they just pop up everywhere, you know, on my phone or on my computer, yeah. as I am, yeah. they remind me, you know, so. Yeah, of course, you know, um, and you can do that even in uh, if you have Exchange and you want these tasks to flow, uh, not just for you, Lou, but if across subcontractors or employees, right? right? Um, yep. So, so we look this capability. We've got 
incorporated, uh, I don't remember exactly when the scheduler first was incorporated, but it wasn't version 1.0, I, I, I know that, because we were using Outlook tasks also. But we found when it comes to productivity, because it automatically populates things, makes them automatically recurring, puts in titles, allows for the workflow, it's a click of a button, it's integrated between the other things that we need to do in TAMS, we found that, hey, having a task in TAMS in Outlook saying it's time to go audit you know, XYZ's account, then going into TAMS and doing it, uh, it was just, you know, it was like, well, why not have this task integrated in TAMS and, and boost our productivity? So there's a place for it, but I can tell you we still have tasks in Outlook as well. So it's not the only tool in the toolbox, um, but uh, it has boosted our uh, workflow and our productivity significantly since we've incorporated this. Mm -hmm. Now it has some nice features. I like it. You know, I just yeah. trying to think of where to where it, it's easier for me to put things, and I haven't decided yet. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, we don't put everything in in here. I have like you know I got to do payroll. Well, I don't put that in in you know in 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 uh, in right. TAMS. You know, so. Um, yeah, a lot of things that are not in, in TAMS, but uh, you can see there's a ton that is, and the things that are in there are there because they, they're better fit and more efficient. Yeah, I, I like that they're linked to the, the client, to the account, you know, maybe even to the supplier, and yeah. you can go as you're in there working on things and, and looking at bills and reconciling information, you can go and find out what's taken place over the last month or so that you may have forgotten yeah or six months ago you know when you found a billing error whatever yeah and as you know uh, when we um, go into our accounts of course on the deleted accounts there are no but you can just click and open up the URL to get to you know the login information you can journal it your entries um, you know it's it's I, I think that once you Start to use it, you'll find that, and and but use the things like open the reminder, or set the reminder, so that they are linked. You know, if you just start off from the scheduler and just do a, add a bunch of manual tasks, you're losing that integration that that is a, a productivity saver. Um, and being able to, I mean, you could still even manual ones you can assign them to a client or to an individual owner. Um, but again, as a, as, a, as a manager, I can look across, I can reassign tasks to, from one person to another as they, you know, as their roles evolve. Um, and so as a, as a manager of a business, I find it uh, very, very useful to make sure I know who has what on their plates. Anyway, well, we'll leave it there then if there's nothing else. I uh, appreciate everyone's participation. And uh, like I said, I did get this recorded, so I'll stop the recording.